All right, we're in the second gravity lecture now, and uh, we're going to actually start um, just by uh, with the very last slide of the first gravity lecture, and that shows you um, the uh, uh, Bouguer correction uh, manipulated uh, with the equation manipulated to uh, uh, tell you how much elevation accuracy you need. And uh, we're going to use this equation again, but in a totally different way. Because instead of um, uh, you know the last lecture is all about how to measure and, and calculate the Bouguer anomaly. Okay, and this lecture now is how to interpret the Bouguer anomaly. So up here uh, um, uh, we have a well we have a cross section. Okay, and uh, you can see it's got a uh, a uh, a slab or half slab of uh, uh, you know, semi-infinite slab that has an anomalous density, one um, uh, million grams, uh, one uh, uh, one thousand kilograms per cubic meter, um, is actually the same uh, same uh, number as uh, one gram per cubic centimeter. All right. So uh, uh, familiar. Uh, 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 density difference, I think. Um, so that's uh, now called uh, delta G. It's a it's a density anomaly. And what would be the uh, the gravity? Um, what would be the gravity anomaly? The Bouguer anomaly we would see over that. Well, uh, you know there would be higher gravity over the uh, um, over the slab than there is not over the slab, right? Because it's a density. It's a density excess. Okay. Now it turns out that um, no matter how deep we put that slab, you know, when we're when we're away from the edge of the slab, right? And you can see that the anomaly uh, tails off, right, and transitions to the the lack of anomaly. All right, on the right. Uh, when we're away from the uh, from the slab, when we're when we're you know away from the edge of the slab, you know, well over the slab. Um, we could put that slab at any depth, you know, between uh, uh, the center of the Earth and um, and the surface, and we would get uh, uh, we would have the same value. Okay, so it's it's uh, an interesting thing that um, uh, in some ways, uh, like uh, magnetics, um, we can only detect lateral density variations or lateral discontinuities. Now that doesn't really make, in my mind, gravity a differential method. It's still an integrative method, um, but and and of course the uh, you know this total uh, Bouguer anomaly over here is uh, being affected by our, our density. But if you ask the the detection question, you know where can we actually see that this slab is present? Well, we need a we we need to have an edge. Uh, and it's that lateral variation in density that will, uh, at the edge of the slab, that will actually show us what looks to us like an anomaly, right? Okay, the whole curve is technically the Bouguer anomaly, uh, but we look for, you know, zigs and zags in the curve, peaks and valleys in the curve, and we call those anomalies, even though, unfortunately, the whole curve is called an anomaly. And and the thing about uh, gravity anomalies, and and it's also uh, partly true of uh, of any potential field anomaly, um, and it's partly true of of any um, um, integrative method anomaly. You can have different shapes at different depths, and they produce precisely the same anomaly. So this this delta G curve, this Bouguer anomaly curve up here. Uh, which has this certain shape uh, is is produced precisely, not approximately, but precisely <clears throat> by having a a sphere at uh, three kilometers or this lensate body at uh, two kilometers depth, or maybe by this uh, you know very drawn out uh, uh, layer, stretched out layer, uh, thin layer, you know slightly thicker uh, at the middle. Uh, at uh, 1.2 kilometers, and and because of that, you know, the, because each of these anomalies produces precisely the same curve, you know, there's no hope of distinguishing uh, what these different uh, 
between these different possibilities. And so you have to accept that. Uh, you have to accept it in, in Remy. You have to accept it in electrical inversion. You have to accept it in magnetics. And, and here's where we, we first learn you know, exactly how we have to accept it in, in gravity. Okay? Um, any of these, um, any of these uh, methods suffer from, from what's uh, called in electrical uh, and uh, in surface waves this equivalence problem. Different anomalies, you know, distributed in different ways, that uh, uh, that give you precisely the same data, okay, um, and uh, we're going to have to learn how to how to grapple with that. I mean, naturally, uh, uh, although the gravity data, you know, won't tell us anything uh, about whether you know whether it's uh, you know one of these particular anomalies or actually some you know any shape in between, right? At a depth and shape that's in between the ones shown here, will can also produce so, uh, the same anomaly. So there's an infinity of different cross sections, an infinity of different models, um, an infinity of different source geometries that produce the same gravity data. And this is one of the reasons why, okay, um, you know these these different models produce the same gravity data, but they will not produce. In fact, uh, you know it takes different anomaly, different Shapes uh, a different type of variation in the shape to produce the same magnetic anomaly. So you combine gravity with magnetics, with uh, uh, with surface waves, with uh, electrical work, and then you can tell, okay, because they all have different uh, different ways that the anomalies have to be that the the features the geology have to be sim similar to produce the same anomaly. And so when you actually combine different data sets, I mean, that's really one of the main things I try to pass on to you in this class. That's how you get around this source geometry ambiguity. Uh, here's another example of source ambiguity. Okay. We have a density excess slab on the left. Okay, so it raises gravity on the left, and, and we don't have it raised on the right. Well, you get the same thing if you have a density, um, uh, lacking density, right? So here is a, a delta, um, that's not a delta G, uh, sorry, this should be a delta rho, right? Density, uh, these are density uh, uh, variations, delta rows uh, of, um, you know, on the top, positive one gram per cc, and on the bottom, minus one gram per cc. So this is a density deficit here, okay? And uh, uh, you can see it will produce precisely the same anomaly, you know, same curvature of the transition, and everything. Okay, can't tell. So uh, uh, here's a more complicated example, uh, and and you know we're going to go through the details of this and figure out you know what exactly is what. All right, these two models. Okay. You know, they notice they have different uh, different density distributions. Um, you know, different depths to various interfaces, like the the basement interface or the bottom of the sandstone. Right? These two models produce uh, exactly, precisely. You know, they're they're. I mean, uh, the two curves produced by these two models will overlie each other precisely. There's no difference. You cannot. Using gravity alone, you cannot distinguish these two models. Okay, maybe using uh, a refraction, you could distinguish these two models. Um, you know, so there's uh, there's there's ways of, of getting around that if you go away from um, from one uh, just one technique. Okay, another way of stating this ambiguity is that any one technique, uh, particularly a potential field technique. Doesn't and cannot ever give you a unique model. You've got to bring in some other constraint. You know, of course, you could you, if you had boreholes here, um, you could and you knew that there was was or was not limestone in this section, then you could tell, right? Of course, you need some constraint from something other than gravity. All right, and that is the that is the problem. Okay, with uh, with gravity surveying. <clears throat> Uh, just you know, here's an explanation of, of why uh, a a continuous sheet is um, 
it, you know, gives you the same gravity no matter what its depth. So, uh, you know, imagine that each of these little uh, blocks along the sheet is is pulling on uh, on these two measurements points, p one and p two. Okay, and um, you know, if you uh, if you raise or lower this, it's not gonna it's not gonna change the uh, um, the proportion of uh, uh, that's that's pulling on p one versus p two. You know, you still get a flat line. All right. And uh, uh, you know, if you do the integration, you can see that it does not. The final result does not depend. You know, even at one point p one, you know that value of the acceleration of gravity, you know, due to this sheet, does not change. Uh, you know, because of course you got to integrate over uh, every single one on the sheet, right? Uh, it's it's not going to change uh, depending on the depth d. Uh, now, but here is a, a real key to, um, you know, getting a, a, an approximate interpretation, and then, you know, you can uh, you can try to match it against, uh, um, you know, your geological intuition or other information you have. Okay, and, and gravity is really great at doing this. Um, you see a um, an anomaly. You know, you've got a delta g. Okay, and um, it's got a certain shape. It's you could say it's got a certain width. Your your anomaly in the Bouguer anomaly curve has a certain width, okay, and um, uh, and and that width is going to depend on the uh, the depth of the anomalous body. So down here we've got cross sections below, and gravity profiles on top, okay, and. Um, you know, the deeper the um, the deeper the the anomalous body is buried, the broader and lower frequency, longer wavelength, this uh, um, this anomaly will be. Okay, so this da dotted one is the deepest one, and that's this very broad, low anomaly here, and the um, uh, the solid lined one is the shallowest one. And it's got the sharpest, the sharpest anomaly curve. Now, this figure also, this slide compares two other things. Okay, um, we're uh, uh, we're looking in cross section here, and um, on the left, you know, we're we're going our cross section goes right through the center of a spherical anomaly. Okay, uh, a bubble, a sphere in three dimensions. Okay. Now, what have we got on the right? Okay, we our cross section is through a uh, essentially a an object as what we call that has cylindrical symmetry. Okay, um, and uh, uh, and we're just looking, you know, so so this instead of being a sphere, this circle here represents the cross section through a cylinder that goes infinitely out of your screen. And infinitely back into your screen, right? So if you hold a pencil up to the up to the screen, and um, uh, and put the tip of it right in the center of the circle, then that's what that that anomaly looks like. Okay, uh, this is the same idea. You know, we're in the middle of the basin and range, and uh, we have all these uh, north south trending valleys, and basically the dip of all the faults and all the uh, all the rocks, uh, all the basin edges. The, the, they all strike pure north, okay, and um, you know so it, as long as we you know move our cross section north or south, it doesn't change, okay, cylindrical symmetry, all right. So um, we can actually use cylindrical symmetry as kind of a shortcut, uh, you know, to if if we can say all right, you know, our 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 situation is not three D. But it's really it's really two D, and we can represent it by this two D cross section, you know. And and no matter where you know how far north we uh, we cut this cross section, uh, then um, uh, then we're going to get the same data, and we have the same you know the 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 anomalous bodies in the same spot. Okay, cylindrical symmetry. It's a it's a you know that means that that we can we can describe the geometry with one profile. We don't have to get three D data. On the other hand, uh, uh, okay, 
So now, now let's notice what's different. Okay, if we assume cylindrical symmetry, all right, then um, um, then uh, 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 and we put a, a body with a certain radius down there. Okay, you know there's a, there's a lot more. You know the you, you're sticking that pencil in and out of the screen, right? There's a lot more mass there. Okay, than there is in the sphere, right? The sphere is just you know, it's just right on the right on the the cross section. It's not really, um, you know, it's not sticking out of the board. There's there's a lot less mass. Okay, now it's close to the profile we're taking, so you know we still see a strong uh, uh, we still still see a strong uh, uh, anomaly. Okay, but the uh, uh, the cylinder gives a larger anomaly than the sphere. So even though that you know the furthest parts of that pencil are a long way away, and of course it goes as one over uh, the radius squared, you know, to the measurement point, um, still there's enough more mass that you get a higher you get a higher uh, uh, a higher peak. But notice this: once you start burying that, it it smooths out faster than burying the sphere does. Okay, so the uh, uh, you know the sphere uh, uh, gives you a uh, an anomaly that stays sharper to deeper. You know the deeper you push it down. All right. So this this is a uh, this slide is worth studying to see all the differences between you know a three D object like a sphere and a two D object uh, like like this uh, this cylinder uh, that has cylindrical what we call cylindrical symmetry. Okay. The thing about wavelength again though. All right, uh, we can tell how deep some things are uh, if they have lateral ends. You know, if they end um, at some x. Okay, so uh, you know, here's a here's a half sheet, uh, a semi-infinite slab, uh, and it has um, it has uh, you know 0.1 uh, gram per cc um, uh, uh, increased density. Okay, so it's a dense sheet. So when you're on top of the sheet, right, you get a higher value. Okay, uh, and and if it's close to the surface, like it is uh, here, it's shallow. You know, then the anomaly is very sharp, and it climbs up to that that eventual value quite quickly. You push it down in depth, the wavelength is greater. Okay, it's smoother, right? And it takes you a while. It's not even shown on the graph. You know when eventually this line, this anomaly, will climb up to the same value as the shallow one. But it's it's going to take it. You're going to have to go out further. Okay. Uh, you know, within the graph here, the shallow one is is basically finding its uh, its minimum and maximum. But uh, the deeper one, you know, is maybe twice as far. You have to go two or three times as far away to get to that same maximum and minimum. Okay, so here's a, a this slide is also very nice because it, it gives you some some really handy ways uh, of very quickly estimating the uh, the depth of the anomalous body. Okay, so um, uh, and again there's a contrast between uh, um, between the uh, um, but between the the 3D the 3D body the 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 sphere and the the cylindrically symmetrical body you know that we're doing a dip profile of um, that is uh, um, um, you know that is uh, 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 at the same uh, at the same depth and has the same radius and the same density contrast right uh, so uh, you know um, Here's uh, uh, here's here's what you can do. Okay, you you notice you have an anomaly. Okay, and it goes from a low, right? You see the anomaly because you can distinguish low values around it to its peak um, uh, Bouguet anomaly value, right? So now you go to where the anomaly has a value that is at half. Okay, half of the of the uh, total anomaly. Um, you know the anomaly difference, right? We climb up this anomaly, and we go a certain number of milligauss to climb up. We we go to half of that uh, of that peak value of that peak difference, right? And at half of that value, we are a certain distance from the center of the anomaly. We call that the half width. Okay, that's the uh, 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 
that's that's half the width of the anomaly at half of its value. Okay, and so uh, for this half width, then um, you know, which is easy to measure, right? We, we can we can we can do this kind of measurement pretty much in the field, right? If we can, as soon as we calculate our um, our at least our rough um, Bouguer anomaly value, you know, bring by bringing in uh, accurate uh, elevations, right? As soon as we calculate that, uh, we can get the half width, and the depth to the center of the bot of the anomalous body is 1.3 half widths. You know, it's just a little bit deeper, 30 percent deeper than the uh, the half width. Okay, uh, now that's for the sphere. Okay, here for the uh, for the cylindrical uh, symmetry for the cylinder, the depth to the center of the cylinder is equal exactly to the half width. All right. Uh, now these are you know these are back of the envelope you know guessing methods. So uh, you know they're uh, they're not meant to be uh, exact. Uh, but sure you know you can definitely tell by the width of the anomaly whether your whether your your anomalous body is one kilometer deep or ten kilometers deep, right? Because the half width is going to be closer to one kilometer or ten kilometers, and that's easy to tell. Okay. Here's a you know here's a really sharp anomaly called uh, caused by a steeply dipping sheet, okay. And in the, the case of that, the the half width uh, is um, is is actually in this case uh, larger than the depth to the uh, the top of the sheet, okay. Uh, the depth is uh, seventy percent of the half width, uh, and so that's the uh, the half width uh, rule of thumb, okay. And and here's the um, uh, uh, here's a more general uh, way of looking at it, uh, with a, a, a simple equation uh, added there. We have an irregular body, right? And we want to get the depth to the top of it. All right. So we find the um, uh, the maximum slope, right? The dg dx uh, maximum, right? There's a there's probably a maximum there, and maybe that's equal to the maximum there. Anyway, we get the value. You know, we have a total. Delta G, right? That that represents the anomaly up to the peak, and then uh, we find that that maximum, right? So we take uh, delta G and we divide by the uh, um, we divide by the uh, um, the uh, the maximum slope, okay? And and then uh, that gives you um, you know you multiply it then by eighty six percent and um, that gives you the uh, a constraint on the ma on the maximum depth to the top surface. Okay, you know how deep is the top of this anomalous body? Well, it's going to be uh, less than or equal to eighty six percent of the peak height of the anomaly divided by the maximum slope of the anomaly. Right. So these are you know uh, and 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 you can uh, use the uh, the you know from the Burr textbook uh, which will use uh, for uh, electrical modeling, right? You can, I mean, and and, uh, and you can use for magnetic modeling. Uh, uh, you know, it also has a uh, a gravity modeling program. And maybe if you took three thirty three, you've done some gravity modeling already, right? So you can you can discover all these things uh, in the process of of running these modeling codes. But also these the half width, the maximum slope method, uh, gives you a really handy way. Of uh, you know quickly making a, a, a broad guess you know but a useful guess at the uh, the depth of the anomaly. Okay, now now um, uh, all right. So so a lot of what we're doing is is trying to isolate those anomalies, right? And um, usually you know we ha kind of have one anomaly buried in another, and so this cross section uh, down on the right here uh, gives an example of that. You know, there's an anomaly that's due to the basement slope in this cross section, right? So that's basically a decrease in gravity towards the uh, left, a decrease in you know this delta G. That's a in milligals. That's a Bouguer anomaly value, right? Uh, there's also this uh, this granite intrusion, okay? And that granite intrusion um, is uh, uh, maybe uh, less dense than the basement. And so that causes a, uh, you know, the basement slope causes a very broad anomaly. The granite intrusion causes a medium broad anomaly. Okay, this uh, swing down here, and then maybe we have a very dense basaltic dike. 
you know, and uh, that basaltic dike then, uh, you know, especially since it comes right near the surface, produces a much sharper anomaly. So you, you add all these together, right, and you get your total observed gravity, right? The, the slope for the dipping strata, the uh, down, uh, downswing for the granite, and the sharp peak for the dike, right? Add all this together, you get your uh, total observed gravity. Likewise, when you're looking at, uh, at, at and trying to identify anomalies, right, you can kind of separate them out in the same way, right? So first, you know, we observe there's an overall westward tilt to the total observed gravity, right? And so we could we could fit that with a line and take out uh, take out the uh, you know the regional trend, okay? And we our residual is going to include uh, you know the dike and the granite, and we might notice there's a uh, you know kind of a broad low. And we could model that and and uh, take that out, and we what we would have left is the is the uh, uh, is 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 the you know what's due to the shallow the shallow part of the dike, right? And you can see that we can distinguish these anomalies because you know the dike is very sharp, very very uh, uh, very high frequency, very long, very short wavelength. The granite is is medium frequency and medium wavelength. And the dipping strata, you know, produces a, an anomaly that's that's very broad, you know, and uh, and very long wavelength. Okay, so um, uh, you know we can go through this process of decomposing the anomalies, and um, and then with you know some other guidance, you know, a structural hypothesis, uh, uh, other data, you know, say refraction data, we can invert. The anomaly for the structure. You know, we got to make we got to make some kind of assumption, and then uh, and then we can do an inversion. Okay. Now, uh, I would I would I would like to push that the first inversion you should always do is the uh, is the Bouguer slab inversion. Okay. And this is very very simple, right? We start with the elevation correction equation, right? Which which uh, gives us the effect of the Bouguer slab. Uh, you know, and this is. Uh, Basically, uh, this row here is the density above the density of air, right? We we have 0.03083 uh, milligal per uh, per meter. Uh, that is the free air correction, right? So, uh, and then we this Bouguer slab is really accounting for the difference between the air and the rock that's actually underneath our our measurement point and between our measurement point and the um, um, and the data. Okay, and that rock has a density of rho. Well, what we have to realize is that that density rho uh, that I'm that I'm uh, pointing out here, that density rho, is really the difference in density. It's really a delta rho, uh, and and when we use it in the elevation correction equation, we use it in the sense that um, uh, it's the difference in density between air, right, which which we're accounting for with the free air correction here. Between air and the rock, so it happens to be the to it's it's a density difference, but it happens to be since it's the difference from zero, it happens to be the the total density of the rock, okay, and that gives us a uh, a delta g, right? So um, now let's let's assume that uh, instead of uh, you know we're going to have a Bouguer slab that that instead of being you know above our datum is down you know down below our datum. It's it's you know what we're trying to find, okay? So we have a Bouguer anomaly delta g, and it's due only to an infinite slab, right? No edge uh, uh, of thickness delta h, right? So we observe we observe an edge. We observe a, a a difference in our anomaly delta g, right? So obviously it has an edge, but we can we can first get a very very simple inversion just by saying, all right, you know, uh, uh, all right, we got a density, we got we got a we got a gravity difference here. And let's just see what it what it would would give us, you know, with an infinite slab, okay? And, and of course, you know, the infinite slab is not going to be a model of that edge, uh, but uh, it's gonna it's gonna start us on the way of explaining, you know, how much uh, you know how much anomalous density do we need, okay? So we have an infinite slab that has a thickness delta h, and a density difference delta rho. And that delta rho can be negative, right? Uh, in what we're doing, we're going to be considering, you know, what is the bedrock um, uh, topography at the bottom of the basin, right? And the the basin is is essentially it's a it's lighter than the bedrock, right? So uh, 
you know, often we can say, all right, the basin might have a density of 2.2 uh, grams per cc, and the bedrock has a grant has a density of 2.7 grams per cc. So we would say the the basin sediments have a density difference of minus 0.5 grams per cc. Okay, a density difference, and in fact, the basin being lighter, uh, you know. All right, what we're going to try to do is figure out, uh, you know, in both the gravity lab and uh, in our field work, is figure out how how thick is that basin below our uh, gravity anomaly. Now, you know, you have a light basin uh, with a negative density difference delta rho, so you should get a negative delta g, right? So, so here's the 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 Bouguer part, uh, the Bouguer slab part pulled out. Okay, it says delta g. Is equal to delta H. That's our thickness. Okay, so delta G is our, our gravity anomaly. Delta and it's in uh, milligals. Delta H is in meters. Okay, and that's a, that's the thickness of our Bouguer slab. And and it's uh, 0 0.04192 times delta rho. That's in grams per cc, and that can be negative. That is our density difference. All right. So in a um, and, and then we solve this equation for delta H. Right. So uh, you know, let's say uh, let's say I've got a uh, a basin with um, um, with uh, 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 you know like the Reno basin here that we'll do our that we'll do our uh, gravity lab on. Uh, you know, we've got a a, a place uh, out uh, at uh, West McCarran and uh, Mayberry. Uh, the delta G there is minus. It's a it's a gravity hole, right? So the delta G is minus. 25 uh, milligal, okay, and then we divide it by 0 0.004192 time, and also divide by the density difference, which for a basin, you know, might be minus 0 0.3, right? So we have a negative, we got a we got a negative gravity um, uh, gravity anomaly, right? Minus 25 milligal. We have a negative density difference, which might be uh, um, you know, delta rho equals minus 0 0.5, right? The negatives cancel, and we get a positive thickness. Okay, turns out you know you you do the simple Bouguer slab calculation for the um, um, uh, for the 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 West Reno basin, and you get about uh, one kilometer depth. Okay, uh, with that, uh, and I think that's with uh, 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 on average of minus 0 0.3 grams per cc. Um, uh, grams per cc uh, uh, density difference. Okay, so that's how that works. So uh, you know, we first ask, you know, how how deep is our basin? So we take our our uh, our uh, maximum gravity difference uh, out in the uh, out in the basin, and uh, we uh, we put it through this simple Bouguer slab equation. We got to assume some some sort of density difference, which we might be able to guess, um, and then. Uh, um, and then we get a, a first estimate of the um, of the thickness of the uh, um, uh, of the basin. Okay. Now, now um, in our gravity lab, we're going to uh, we're going to explore you know a further um, um, a further uh, um, basin. Uh, I, I mean. Uh, uh, further and more accurate inversion. Okay, so so um, you know this uh, is a uh, uh, a figure you'll see again when we do the gravity lab, and um, uh, basically uh, the data is on top and the model the the you know the uh, depth to the bottom of the basin is on the bottom. Okay, and um, you know the depth to bedrock. Is down here, and this is the uh, the data. Okay, so we have a uh, Bouguer anomaly value, and it gets to negative twenty five when we're in the center of the basin. Okay, which is right about at Mayberry and McCarran. Um, and uh, if you go through the Bouguer slab equation, you get this uh, this curve here, you know, which is a which is a a, a grow. You can see it's kind of a minimum approximation. Where the basin's not too deep, it's actually pretty close to the final result, which is the the solid blue curve. Okay, 
Um, but where the basin is deep, and, and particularly where there are these, uh, you know, you can see there's these gravity gradients here, uh, where the gravity decreases rather rapidly, um, and uh, <coughs> and the inversion is going to put in some some real deepenings of the basin there. You know, maybe these are the bounding faults. Okay, and um, uh, and this is somewhat uh, vertically exaggerated, uh, probably a factor of uh, uh, two or three vertically exaggerated. So not not hugely vertically exaggerated, but some. Um, so the uh, the Bouguer slab basically kind of gave us a minimum, you know, deflection, a minimum thickness of the basin, and then we found that that you know to fit the gravity gradients, okay, the um, um, the uh, the the Bouguet slab uh, um, or, or the uh, the inversion, okay, and uh, you know we'll find out more about this inversion when we do the gravity lab, but the inversion, you know, has to put in much greater depths. Okay, now now how is that? Well, uh, up on top, okay, this Bouguet slab, uh, once you put it through the actual two D or three D calculation, you can see it's only generating part. Of the gravity anomaly, it's generating this this dotted line here, okay, and so you know to get the rest of the you know that's only going down to like twelve, uh, you know a maximum uh, anomaly of twelve milligals, all right. So to get all the way to twenty five milligals, right, it's gotta it's gotta make the basin deeper, okay, to provide more gravity anomaly, you know a, a smaller uh, uh, Bouguet anomaly value. Okay, and more contrast with the areas outside of the basin, right? You know, over here on the right-hand side, the the thickness is zero, and so we're outside the basin. Okay, at least at the edge of the basin. So the Bouguet slab equation, you know, doesn't provide enough anomaly over here. Uh, actually, near the edge of the basin, you know, where the slope is very shallow, it really is. Uh, uh, you know, you you don't get much better than that. Uh, but then we get to near these gravity gradients, you know, and they're just too steep, and and it's got to put a more of a, a density hole there to match the the actual gravity measurements. Uh, now this Bouguet slab equation is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, whether it's Bouguet slab equation or actually the the two D Talwani uh, inversion, okay, the Talwani inversion is assuming cylindrical symmetry, and I happen to know that you know, and on the gravity map of uh, West Reno, you can see that the um, uh, the anomaly, you know, doesn't extend infinitely north and south. It's pretty much restricted to the West Reno neighborhood. Um, so, uh, in fact, if we did a 3D Talwani inversion, you know, it wouldn't, you know, even this uh, uh, this 2D anomaly um, would not uh, uh, would not match the uh, um, or, or the this this 2D uh, you know cylindrically symmetric. Um, you know, infinitely north and south extending basin is is uh, not going to match the gravity. It's not going to be quite enough. It's going to have to put in an even deeper basin here to match the gravity data. Okay, and uh, that is uh, uh, a difference. You know, certainly you go from the 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 one D approximation. You know, the one D inversion. That's the Bouguet slab equation, right? Just very simple as as at the bottom of this slide, right? That gives you a uh, a minimum depth. Right, you go to a two D calculation, you get you get more depth, you get a deeper basin, okay, um, you know, or or uh, yeah, you get a deeper basin or or more uh, density difference, okay, and then if you go from two D to three D, which I'm not showing you here, you'll get an even deeper basin, right? So the three D basin would be uh, even further down here, uh, and that's uh, that's kind of how it progresses, you know, one D Bouguet slab. Um, you know that's the minimum uh, minimum thickness, minimum uh, basin thickness. Two uh, D Talwani inversion. Okay, you'll get uh, you'll get a deeper basin. Okay, and you go to a three D inversion, and you'll get uh, an even deeper basin. Right, because there's just you know there's a lot of mass in that uh, in that two D uh, uh, you know basin that's extending infinitely north and south, and that's not there in the true three D situation. So you know, to model that same uh, uh, that same anomaly, you got to have an even uh, an even deeper basin. You know, at the center anyway. Here's some other uh, uh, guidelines you can use uh, in 
uh, you know, just observe from the data and and use those to guide your your modeling. Okay, uh, you know, if you take a, a you know, let's say this normally faulted sheet, right? Um, and basically, you have the uh, uh, the deeper uh, uh, the deeper slab. Uh, you know, you, you get far enough to the left, right, out towards uh, positive infinity or or negative infinity here. Um, you get you get to the you know away from the edge, and it all goes to the same value, right? So uh, uh, if you just have sheet B, you know it's going to be raised over here on the left, and if you just have sheet A on the right, it's going to be raised. The gravity is going to be raised over here on the right. Okay, but it's all about the shape of the edge, and that's how you can tell that there's faulting. That's how you can tell that um, you know like which side is down, right? Because because look, uh, uh, sheet B is deeper, right? Um, so uh, uh, here's the anomaly to sheet B, which is kind of you know, right. It's it's um, it's kind of uh, um, the anomaly uh, due to sheet B is kind of long wavelength because it's deeper. The anomaly due to sheet A is sharper because it's uh, it's not so deep, right? And you add them both together, which which you know is exactly what you need to do with gravity. You just add it together arithmetically, and uh, and you notice that uh, uh, you get kind of this off-center anomaly, right? Uh, and so that's how you can tell which side is up, which side is shallower. And and you can even uh, you know. You might be able to make some conclusions about the depth. Now, uh, I mean, sorry about the dip of the of the fault. Now, this requires lots of other control, right? You got to make sure that that you know you 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 know that this faulted sheet is is uh, is what's producing the uh, the gravity anomaly, and uh, you know. But with some other constraints, uh, you know, constraining information, you really can uh, uh, see the difference in the gravity anomaly and interpret it. So if it's a you know the 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 case below it's a normally faulted sheet, okay we all, we always have the right side up here but it's a normally faulted sheet, and the dip of the fault is sixty degrees, okay then there's a gap and there's a there's more of a hole right there's less dense you know there's a sheet gap right as a normal fault opens up, and and there's less density there. So overall, so you see mostly a negative anomaly right. That's the gray points here, and if you go to uh, if you go to uh, uh, a thrust uh, thrust faulted sheet, right, uh, then uh, then there's you know an overlap here, and there's more density, so it's going to be a more it's I mean off center positive anomaly, and then if it's a ninety degree fault, uh, then uh, uh, you know you get the the centered and uh, uh, symmetrical anomaly, okay. So uh, you know the 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 asymmetry, the the off-centeredness, uh, that will uh, uh, that will tell that can tell you you know if you get enough control that can tell you what the dip is. Uh, and you can use uh, tools just like uh, a, a spreadsheet here that's set up uh, that uh, will give you the uh, the faulting the fault dip. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, right at the end here about. Um, uh, you know, field effort for uh, gravity work. Okay, uh, once you guys get good at it, you will probably be able to take your three readings in two to six minutes. You know, as long as you're uh, careful to level and you um, um, and and your gravity meter hasn't been jostled and you and you know you don't have to turn the dial a whole bunch because you just went up or down a whole bunch in elevation. You know, as you're as you're you know proceeding along a line. Uh, it's not going to take you eventually, you know, once you're trained, once you have some experience, it's going to take you two to six minutes to get those three readings that I want at each gravity station. Okay. Um, and, and actually, uh, uh, when you're using, um, when you're using, uh, you know, post-process GPS, uh, where you're doing, uh, you know, dual frequency phase, uh, observations. Okay. Uh, for that accurate, uh, velocity, uh, you know, differential GPS. I'm sorry, accurate uh, elevation. Um, you know, one foot accurate elevation. You know, six minutes is about what you need to get the uh, um, to get the uh, uh, the uh, enough GPS data collected. Now we have the privilege of of using uh, uh, the government's uh, real time RTK unit, 
and uh, that's going to cut. You know, for similar um, for similar accuracy, that's going to vastly cut the um, uh, the time it's going to take us to uh, to take an accurate GPS reading. So, you know, reading the gravimeter is 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 going to be our our uh, you know essential uh, 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 time sink. Okay, uh, if you're using a theodolite, um, you know uh, that may have a similar uh, you know hopefully just two minutes. But you know if you're if you're more than a kilometer away from the theodolite with the uh, with the reflector and stadia rod, it might take six minutes to get that uh, to get that uh, constraint. So so you know each gravity reading isn't taking that long. You know you might uh, you might be able to get ten per hour, right? Um, and so really the travel time between stations that's the controlling factor, okay? And if I have you out walking on the on the east side, uh, or or, or uh, to the south, uh, you know, away from roads, uh, where we can't, uh, maybe we won't be able to, allowed to drive, you know. So really, that walking time between stations that's going to be the controlling factor. You know, it's going to take a, a minute or two for you to get, uh, you know, the hundred meters between uh, stations. Uh, and if the stations are farther apart than that, it's going to take you longer. Okay, and then uh, you know you might need uh, uh, one. Uh, one day office time uh, for the you know reducing and checking and cross checking the uh, the two or three days worth of uh, of uh, gravity field work. Okay, so that's how you can how you can bid it out. Uh, now uh, uh, you know I'm I'm requiring the gravity group um, to take a look at at the existing data that's in the Paces database. Right, we don't want to repeat too many of of the uh, existing. Uh, Gravity data points that are that are around Schur's, okay, uh, and then uh, as we as we had to do do with our Mount Hood project, we had to actually integrate our new data together with the older data sets, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to do that uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the Schur's area as well. You know, we will set our new results into the background of the you know what's what are no doubt be more scattered, more sparse older results, okay. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have to do some sort of interpretation or modeling, right? We might just use, uh, we might make some conclusions just from observing where the gravity gradients are, uh, and uh, and and check those uh, those gradients to see, um, 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 you know, to see where those, uh, um, and and check those gradients, you know, maybe with a half a simple half width observation. Uh, just to see how deep, you know, are we are we looking deep enough for this to be the basin floor? That's going to be our question in Schur's. Okay, uh, and and you know, this guidance from uh, Gary here is is very uh, is very valuable. You know, simple interpretations. You know, not putting in fifty bodies and uh, and trying to balance everything out. You know, not trying to fit every little zig and zag. Precisely of the gravity curve, right? Simple interpretations are best. Okay, and and if they if they link in data from outcrop, and they link in real information from drill holes or maybe from other geophysical techniques, uh, then they're they're most likely to be valid. Okay, so you know Occam's razor is is the the rule of the day. Um, you know we want simple interpretations. The simplest one. That explains 90% of the of the gravity anomaly. That's the one I'm going to be happiest with. Um, and and we'll see what happens when you in the gravity lab. We'll see what happens when you try to invert uh, gravity data too accurately. Okay. So uh, you know the overall cost, depending on you know the distance between uh, stations and all that, and how hard they are to access. Right? Do you have to? Climb up a mountainside, uh, or or can you just drive to it? Okay, in in ten seconds, right? So twenty dollars to two hundred dollars per station. You know the accessibility makes a huge difference there. So if you have a field vehicle and um, uh, and uh, uh, a gravimeter um, and a uh, and an accurate GPS, especially with this uh, RTK, right? You might uh, be able to charge. Uh, uh, Nine hundred to uh, fifteen hundred dollars per uh, uh, per field day, right? Uh, that's the the cost for a trained person to uh, to take these kinds of measurements. Okay, 
And uh, if you're lucky, you can get, uh, you know, for that $900 to $1,500, you know, depending on accessibility again, you'll get 10 to 60 stations per day. Okay? Uh, and that's, uh, uh, you know, we used to try to use differential uh, L1, L2 carrier phase uh, GPS, okay, uh, relying on uh, local base stations like around here in southern Washoe County. There's a lot of county maintained stations, okay, um, and uh, we can easily get that one foot uh, elevation control, you know, that uh, uh, 30 centimeter uh, uh, elevation control. Uh, with 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 that, uh, but you know we're going to do. It's going to be so much easier with uh, the uh, RTK system that uh, Dan Munger is bringing bringing to us. Um, you know, I expect uh, I expect uh, you know most of our effort is going to go into you know doing the gravity measurements and and to walking across areas we're not allowed to drive, and uh, uh, the GPS is going to be a fairly simple um, simple affair since. Uh, we're, we're, we have the benefit of using such great equipment. Uh, here's, a, here's an example. Uh, uh, you know, this is an attempt essentially at a, at a riffability study uh, and a void study uh, using gravity. So um, notice that the, uh, the biggest void, which is down here in this section, okay, so a void is, uh, is uh, uh, filled uh, perhaps with water. Uh, or perhaps with, uh, with air and Medford Caves, Florida, that's probably an air airfield uh, uh, airfield void, okay, and that's producing the you know the two voids together are producing the largest gravity anomaly, but you can't see the scale in the video for sure. But if you look at the the notes, you'll see that the gravity anomaly here is only you know thirty five microgal, right? So that's 0 0.03 milligal, which is really at the this is at the the absolute limit. Of the uh, the resolution, you know, as as we have, uh, you know, proved with classes, that's at the absolute limit of resolution of our gravimeter. Okay, uh, we have a chance, you know, with very careful uh, elevation control, um, you know, surveyed into the nearest centimeter, we might be able to do it, uh, and without having to mess around with uh, terrain corrections too much, we we might be able to achieve this, um, and that's what the voids do. Now, notice that these these anomalies are mimicked. You know, pretty severely, especially over here at the right-hand side, um, which I hope you can see in the video. Um, uh, they're mimicked by these, uh, you know, the clay that's filling the karst depressions, uh, like the one that that, that poor fellow uh, also in Florida fell into, uh, got sucked into, uh, that opened up in his bedroom, right? So karst is, uh, you know, filled with, uh, you know, less dense material. And that's producing these uh, these same kinds of, of anomalies. So, um, you know, they could tell that this anomaly here was not from uh, sand and clay, uh, but from um, but from uh, a cave because they know where the cave is. Okay, uh, but uh, you know, how could you distinguish them in the field? Right? There's not necessarily much difference.